loving people God's way. Not our way. <laughs> God's way. It's a little bit different because we'll see in God's word how there tends to be a little difference on that. Uh, but first, let's take our Bibles in hand and stand with me, my friends, as we make this declaration together. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I'm open and ready to receive from God's living Word. That is so good. Now I want you to interact with me for a little bit. I want you to interact with me and just go ahead and text me. How has our 40 days of love influenced you thus far? What have, what have you seen happen in your life? What is changing? What are you growing in? How have, what have you maybe picked up? In our 40 days of love thus far, what has hit home for you? Just go ahead and text me, 920-256-3077. And while we're talking about the 40 days of love, I gotta talk to you about a couple of teenagers who were in love. It was only puppy love, but love puppy love is real to puppies. Yeah. So this boy and girl come, and he walks the girl up to her front door after going out on a date, and he leans on the wall. And while he's leaning there on the wall, he says, what do you think? Could we share a goodnight kiss? And she says, no way, no way. My parents could be watching and he's just leaning on the wall there saying, oh, come on, just a little kiss. They, they won't even see. And she says, no, no, I, I just, I don't. And she called, oh, come on, honey, please. No, 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 I, I, I just can't say. Oh, come on, just one little, one little smooch. You, you'll let me. One little, all of a sudden, the porch light comes on. And the door opens up, and there's her sister, all disheveled in her night down pajamas and says all right dad says you can give him a good night kiss and if you won't give him a good night kiss I'll do it for you or dad says he will come down and kiss him good night but would you please tell him at least to take his hand off of the intercom button <laughs> yeah 40 days of love what have we gotten so far? Here's just a few good things. Oh, this is good. I like this. This is from, uh, from John and Kirsten and Rush out in North Carolina in our <laughs> campus there. And they're part of our online small group that I share with 40 Days of Love. This is just really wise. Slowing down and connecting with others more. That is wisdom, isn't it? We need that. Slow down. For somebody who's hyperactive and attention deficit disorder, I can use that one. <laughs> Thank you, John. Oh, I const constantly have to remind myself of that. Yes. This one, this is a praise report. They're in Green Bay this morning. This is Virgil just testifying. We were praying for Phoenix last week. Things are improving. And since last Sunday, we praise God for that and pray for continued healing for him. And we will continue to pray and agree. And thank you for being with us online, Virgil. God bless you. Also, here's another one. It has helped me with my temper by seeing people differently. That's good. That is healthy. And also, here's another one. It says, the 40 days of love has created a desire to be purposeful in expressing love to others in the love language, each individual according to whom they are and not what I perceive they need. That is incredible insight. Wow. That, that's mind-blowing. That's a phenomenal insight. Thank you. This one says, it has brought us closer to the people we want to be closer to. I like that. Yes, we need that. It's building healthy relationships. We need that. Being closer. 
And this one says, loving on my family more, letting them know that they are loved unconditionally. Oh, that is so good. And I hope these 40 days of love are enriching for you and continue to be. I know I'm growing, and we all need more love within our lives. I want you to turn to a scripture in your Bibles together. Passage of 1 John, 1 John chapter number 4. Now, I can recite this for us, but I, I want us to look together at it because I want you to have this visually in your, your brain, just focusing on it and soaking this up. 1 John chapter number 4. The Apostle John says this in verse 7 and verse 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Wow. We're going to come back to that passage in just a little bit. First, let's put some pieces together of where we've come from. In our Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't make any idols. Not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. These four commandments, you keep them. You keep all four of these commandments naturally when you do this, when you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love fulfills the commandment. And these six commandments, honor your father and your mother, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. You keep these automatically when you really love, when you shall love your neighbor as yourself. When you love people, you make the healthy and the good choices. In this law of love that we have looked at from Romans chapter number 13. In Romans 13, we saw in verses 8 through 10, owe no one anything but to love one another. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you sh don't bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are, are all summed up in this this saying just namely love your neighbor as yourself for love does no harm to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfillment of the law love is the empowerment behind it love is the strength for it we need a lot more love then don't we in this law of love love does no harm it, it, it doesn't violate the commandments. Instead, it empowers you for them. Love keeps them. Love treasures. And love uses those commandments as well as the wisdom to build healthy relationships. Relationship with God. Relationships with people. We looked last week at the greatest is love. We saw from 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest is love. If we're not doing it in love, we're doing it wrong. Because love is our motive. Love is our modus operandi. It should be the power from which we live. This world is self-serving. So we must, as the family of God, as the body of Christ, maintain a culture of serving in love. Then we looked at the greatest love. Well, the greatest love is Jesus and he gave us a new commandment. He said, a new commandment I give to you. That you love others as I have loved you. And we looked at that. The old commandment said you love others as you love yourself. But some of you are not very good at loving yourselves. <laughs> some of you are not very nice to yourselves. Some of you are down on yourselves. And if you love other people the way you love yourself, some of you would be in prison. <laughs> so... Jesus changed it and said, I want you to love the way I have loved. Love as Jesus loved. That's the greatest love. 
and the greatest is love. So to love as Jesus loved, you're going to have to have a better understanding of his love. And that's where we need today to look at God's love in a deeper way. I want you to see in the first part of what we share here that God's personality is in his love. Not only do you find God's personality in his love, you also find that in his love is his perfection, as well as his provision. First, we're going to look at God's personality. This is important, and this takes us back to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Now it says here, Beloved, let us love one another. Now this is the Apostle John in the first epistle of John writing to one of the churches that he was a part of. You would think, wait a minute. Why does he have to tell the church people to love each other? Church people need to learn to love each other too. Mm -hmm. There is no one who has this down perfectly. Every one of us needs to improve in our love. Let us love one another. Why? Because love is of God. And everyone that loves knows God and is born of God. But he that doesn't love, love in real love, doesn't know God. That's a big statement. If you're living your life and you're really not living in love, you really don't know God. You really have no clue as to who God is, is what John's saying, because God is love. Now, that does not mean that God is this mushy, soft, hormonal feeling. That's not what it means. It uses in Greek what's called an anathorist noun. Now, when you use an articular noun, you're identifying someone. But when you use an anathorist noun, you are describing their essence and their nature. So when the Apostle John wants to tell you who Jesus is or who God is, to explain what the nature of Father God is, he recalls back to his experiences of being with Jesus. Now, the Apostle Paul writes, Jesus is the express image of the Father. So you want to know what Father God is like? You just look at Jesus. He's the express image image. He's the split image of his daddy. Okay? That's who he is. He's the split image of father. So if father is just like Jesus, and John looks at Jesus and says, you want to know what, what love is about? He says, I, I look at Jesus and the way he treated people. That's why we're going through that, the book together, The Relationship Principles of Jesus. We're looking at the life of Jesus and we're seeing, wow, just the way he lived was so loving. Everything he did was loving. If I'm going to describe Jesus to you, it's love. It's a description of what his nature is. It's for God so loved the world that's why he gave his son. He was operating completely out of love. And when Jesus touched people, healed people, ministered to people, spoke to people, spent time with people, everything was about love. When he welcomed the children to come, it's because he loved them. When he touched people's lives, it's because he loved them. Even when he was stern with someone, it was always, always in love desiring repentance, desiring transformation and change. Now that's important. It's important to understand the personality of God as being loving because we relate to other people based on personalities. You respond to people according to their personalities. You interact with them based upon their personalities. If somebody is a very quiet, shy person, you tend to be a little gentler with them, a little more calm with them, quiet with them. If somebody's a happy-go-lucky person, it just tends to invite you in and you interact with their personality. And God, God's personality is just so loving and gracious, and he wants you to interact with him in the dimension of his personality. The problem is... 
So many people wrongly assume what God's personality is like from their own projection of error. Some people will wrongly project that, well, God is this mean old guy with a gray beard, hard of hearing, kind of grumpy, up there with a baseball bat. He's got his Louisville slugger and just screw up one more time. I'm just squared. And they think God is this mean old guy on a throne. That's not what he's like at all. First of all, he doesn't have a gray beard. <laughs> Only I have the gray. <laughs> God, in the midst of all of his timeless imperfection, no, he's not mean, he's not grumpy, he's not angry, he's not harsh. We got to be careful we don't project false images on God. And how do we get the right image? Well, the right image would be based right here. It would be based on his book that tells us about him, that shows us his personality. Because when we go through the Gospels and we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see this tender, loving, gracious Jesus, healing, providing, blessing, and that's the express image of Father, then we begin to see who he really is and what God is really like. And God wants that for you. He wants you to see him in his truth, in his word, and to interact with him that way. Because God's essence is love. God's being is holiness. God's constitution is truth. God's nature is faithfulness. You put those things together and so much more, and it is just per pure perfection. There you have God's personality. It's not love who puts up with garbage and stuff and ignores sin. No, it's God's love plus his being of God says, I am holy, so you should be holy. It's not God accepting little white lies. No, his constitution is truth. It's not God being there for you sometimes. No, his faithfulness has him there for you all the time. You start seeing these things, you start seeing God is so perfect, isn't he? He's everything you need in a friend. He is everything you need in every way in your life. So, if we relate to him that way, we can also see him in his fruits of the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, patience, self-control. There is nothing in the law against any of these things. No, this is the fulfillment. This is God's personality for us to model. And to then begin to transition our lives into being like him, copying his personality, and being more like him in our personality. Now, God's love is in his personality. You see his love that way. His personality is love, but also his perfection is in his love. I want you to see that. To see this, you need to go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter number 5. So we go to the Gospel of Matthew and chapter number 5. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, which is Jesus, you'd call it his Magna Carta, his great charter. It's showing as the rabbi who steps onto the scene, this is what my teaching's all about. This is the foundation of who I am in teaching you and what Father God has brought me here for. In Matthew 5, starting at verse 43, Jesus says, You have heard, you have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Plenty of that going around, isn't there? But I say to you, wait, that's not the way it is? No, he says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Love 
your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Because there's a comma at the end of that sentence. The reason that you're supposed to do all those things, comma, is that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So you can really be like Father. So you can be the express image of Father. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love only those who love you, what reward have you? Don't even tax collectors do the same? And if you, if you greet your brother only, what, what do you do more than others? Don't even tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Perfect. Oh boy, I don't know if I can live up to perfect. Understand perfect in this context, you will. First understand Jesus is teaching completely counterculture, completely against the culture that he was in because in his culture there were the Romans that were ruling militarily. And those Romans were everywhere, controlling things, demanding things, and ruthless in their punishment. They had right there in the midst of them those that they hated. Then there were even their neighbors, the Samaritans. And the Samaritans they called them half-breeds. They called them dogs. They labeled them as every bad thing you could imagine. If you really wanted to insult somebody, you would say, you're a Samaritan. Whew. Notice how Jesus, in the parable of the good Samaritan, really slammed their bias and their prejudice right back. They hated them. They hated them with absolute disdain. And Jesus is saying, you don't hate your enemies. Really? Aren't you supposed to hate Gentiles, non-Jews? No. Jesus' teaching was totally counterculture. In fact, seven times you will see in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you have heard, but I'm telling you, and he totally changes what they're supposed to be thinking. We need that because right here in the middle of our culture, we have some vicious stuff going on. I call it America's cancer of cancel culture. People that, I don't like you. I don't like what you say. I hate you. Shut up. You're not allowed to talk because I don't agree with you, so shut up. And we're going to protest you and hate you and shut you down and, and punish you in every way we can and destroy your life because I don't agree with you. That's America's cancer right now, this cancel culture. The church cannot be cancel culture. The church is called to not hate your enemies. They're doing what you have heard. You have heard hate your enemies. And Jesus says, no, no, you don't hate your enemies. You need to love your enemies because only loving only those who love you is wrong. It's wrong. It's not the way Father is. If you're going to be like Father, whose personality is love, if you're going to be like God, you cannot be like those. You have a higher calling of love within your life. Being perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. Perfect doesn't mean you never screw up. Perfect doesn't mean that you never do anything wrong. That's not what perfect means here. Perfect means you need to act like Father does. You need to love the way Father does. You need to treat everybody with love. 
Don't just love your neighbors, love your friends, and hate your enemies. No, just love everybody. And that will make you like Father. Because Father's personality is love, and God's perfection is in his love. And it's supposed to be for you and I, too. Our perfection is in love. Loving even those who don't love you. Now, that's hard. That's not the easy part. That's the hard part. Because there are some people, let's face it, that they just get under your, yeah, <laughs> they just know how to push the buttons. They just, some people can drive you crazy. And you still, Father says, I want you to love them. Why? Because God does not want you under the control of hatred. Some people, yes, they intentionally will even do things to rile you up. And Father says, and I want you to love them. Why? Because then you're not under their control. Because the people that want to rile you up, if you won't get riled, if you won't fall into their trap and live under their control, not only does that set you free, but it's like a wake up, take the blinders off. They can see, here's somebody that isn't controlled by my unkindness. How in the world can they be so different? And they see in you the love of God. And they may disdain you, hate you, mistreat you, but then they're thinking, I want to be like you. I want what you've got. So we need to love even those who don't love us, perhaps especially. That's the perfection of God. Now, last Thursday night, when we have our small group for our 40 days of love, one, one of the individuals there said, you know, as we were sharing about what we've come to so far in our growing, said, I, I understand how Jesus loves. I'm not there. This is not going to happen overnight. I'm growing but I can't be Jesus. I just can try to be more like Jesus. So understand, we're all in this process together. Nobody's there except Jesus. So his perfection in his love is something we grow in. So we need to grow in it. Third thing is the provision in his love. Then the provision in his love. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. The word that's used there is agape. He agape loved you. That particular word is often translated or understood as unconditional love. Now, there are different words for love in the Greek. There is the, the word agape, unconditional love. There's also phileo, which means friendship love, like Philadelphia is phile, friend, Delphi, city. City of brotherly love is what it means. Phileo, brotherly love. There's also storge and eros, different types of love. But the love that God loves you with, he says, I have loved you with this agape love. Thomas Aquinas, theologian, philosopher, said, agape love is to will the good of another. Now, usually we don't will the good of our enemies. We don't wish good on our enemies. We usually wish evil on our enemies. But Jesus calls us to love with Father's love and his perfection, his personality, to be our personality. He calls us to will the good of another. And in order for that to happen, you first of all need to receive his love. Because if you love others the way you love yourself, some of you are really going to screw up. Some of you, like I said, would be in prison if you love others the way you love yourself. So you need to understand this agape love. Agape love means to love. It means to value. It means to esteem. And you need to know that God values you. So much does he value you that he sent his own son to die in your place. He values you wanting him with you, you with him. He esteems you. That means he speaks well of you. He believes in you. Isn't it nice to know somebody believes in you? Father God does. He agape loves you. The fourth meaning is that he feels or manifests generous concern for. 
Father is so concerned about you. He is. He's concerned about you. Every step of your life, how you're doing, how you're responding, where you're at. Not because he wants to judge you, but because he wants to heal you. And he wants to bless you. He wants a healthy relationship with you. And he wants healthy relationships for you. He has incredible, genuine, generous concern for you. And agape love means to be faithful towards. And he is so faithful towards us, isn't he? He's always there for you. Even at the times it seems like he's so far away. We think like there's a big brick wall between me and God, but God's on the same side of the brick wall as you are. He's always with you. It also means to delight in. That means God really likes being with you. He doesn't just love you and put up with you. He doesn't just tolerate you. He actually likes you. He actually delights in you. He thinks it's awesome to have you around. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that, it feels nice to be loved that way, doesn't it? We want to be loved that way. The seventh meaning of it means to set your store upon. This means I am building everything in the future upon this. I am treasuring this in the now, and I'm making this what the future is going to be. And God's love with you is doing that. And God calls us to take this and accept his love for us as that and then begin to do that in our love for others, to love others the way he has loved us. Final thought from you from David Siemens in his book, Healing for Damaged Emotions. God doesn't love you because you're good. (laughs) That's for sure. That's a no-brainer, right? God doesn't love you because you're good. God loves you because you need his love in order to be good. And if you can see his love and receive his love, you can then begin to better give his love. So you need to receive his love. We all need to grow in love. Freely you have received, the scripture says. You need to freely give. So let's stand together. Let's close in prayer. And we're going to pray that we can grow in love. Wow, we really need this. Because God wants you to grow in his love for you. His love is his personality. His love is his provision. It is his perfection. Would you just close your eyes for a moment and let's all out loud pray this prayer together. Say, Dear Jesus, you are the exact image of Father God, and you are love. Father, you have loved us so much that you gave your Son for us. And Jesus, you loved me so much. Even before I was born, you died in my place paid for my sin. I am really loved. I am really valued. I am really esteemed. I am really treasured. I am really cared for by you. You delight in me. You want me with you. So you paid for my sins, died and rose again, And I surrender my life to you. I receive your forgiveness. And with the love that you have loved me, that perfect love that loves me just the way I am, I want to love others too. Help me grow in love. Grow in how much you love me. And grow in loving others. I don't want to have the cancer of this culture. I don't want to cancel people out. I want to win them to Jesus. I want to bring them your love. So use me, Lord. Love through me. And help me love just like you. In Jesus' name, amen.